What's up, fellas? What we're doing tonight is melting down this piece of e-waste metal that we got. What we got going on tonight is we're making an e-waste anode. This is the second process. We've already removed the copper through electrolysis and created an anode mud or anode sludge. And from that sludge, we smelted it, 101 grams of it, and we got this five gram ingot. A little bit of material did get caught in the top layer of slag because I used a silicon carbide crucible. But uh, nonetheless, we're gonna heat this up, throw some borax on it, and we're gonna try and uh, melt this. And we're gonna look to see if it melts without glowing. We're in a bit of a, a little bit of trouble if that happens. Hopefully it has to be almost white hot before it melts because it's got a very odd color and I'm wondering if we've made some kind of silicon alloy or something. I use salt or silica alloy I should say. I don't know if silica mixes with metal. Only silicon does, my bad. So I don't know what happened to this thing, but it has a very strange color to it. Maybe it's just mostly tin, but we're gonna find out. So we're gonna melt it. We're gonna pour it in this little slot here to try and make an anode out of it. And then we're gonna try to electrolyze the gold from that little anode. We're gonna be using a huge oxyhydrogen electrolysis torch to uh, generate the flame. We will be infusing the oxyhydrogen with propane gas so we don't oxidize the thing to death. This is the electrolyzer that we're using. People ask about these things all the time. I've got uh, a lot of other electrolyzer videos and these things are just very fascinating to a lot of people. So I just want to give you guys a quick shot of the mess I have going on here. Just kind of, all these big tanks are basically to mitigate foaming. When you're running 40 amps through this thing, the um, electrolyte becomes entrained with bubbles and the foam has to be given time to die down so it doesn't come shooting out of the torch nozzle. So that's why you see these tanks. They're just foam dissipators and that's their purpose. The rest of this stuff is just to uh, keep it cool and all that stuff here. We hit, the air compressor is used to add air to the gas whenever we need it. It does provide a different flame. You don't have to add just propane. You can add other gases and you can bubble it through acetone. And that has a very desirable effect when soldering and brazing. But tonight we're gonna to be using it to do a little bit of uh, fire assay work, I guess if you would call it that, because I'm also interested to see it, how well you can cupel metal with this torch without oxidizing it to death. So I'm gonna do my best to run a fairly reducing flame. This is just a little homemade torch. I don't even have a real torch for this thing. And if you're curious, you're looking at about, I think it was $4,800 to $4,500 worth of parts. It was in the $4,000 range and as far as man hours to build it was another five thousand dollars so quite a bit going on here one of the most time um, consuming parts of this whole process was the fabrication and assembly of the electrolyzer itself this is not an easy thing to put together by any means it can get tricky for uh, more reasons than one but Luckily, this one's not leaking to date, and it's been sitting here full of fluid for the longest time. And if you keep the pH above 12 in your electrolyte, you can avoid a lot of corrosion that takes place from just sitting. Five gram bead. Okay, here we go. Okay, that's a terrible sign, guys. It's melting already. Look at that. 
Okay guys, so uh, my worst fears took place and indeed the uh, piece of metal melted before it became incandescent. Which means this is mostly tin, as I presumed. Back to the drawing board, I guess. I take that back. I'm just going to smash this thing with a hammer and proceed forward with the electrolyzer cell and answer the question whether or not it can be done. We'll coupel some stuff another time. Guys, check that out. Riddle me that. I'm going to have to look at that XRF again. Check that out, fellas. Boy, I'll tell you what, good thing I'm stubborn and decided to smash this with a hammer. What happened? Now, being stubborn doesn't always pay off, so... Do not consider that advice. All right, let's get this thing out of its cocoon and have a look at what's going on. Something just really, really weird is going on. This is a piece of the metal bead. It, too, is very fragile. So we have a definite interface here maybe this is uh who knows look at that two different distinctive compounds that don't appear to want to mix okay i'm gonna give it a shot fellas let's see what happens here she's pinned wow is that horrible Oh, this is terrible. Now we're going to try some of the good stuff. And that's the metal piece. That's what we should be seeing with this big piece. And instead, we're getting that. So, yeah. We have a metalloid involved. That's That little cone was surrounded in a metalloid silicon alloy that for whatever reason did not want to mix with this so let's do a tally we had five grams of good stuff in the beginning and uh out of that five grams we got 3.6 grams of actual metal that conducts electricity this conducts electricity like silicon does this, in fact, may be pure silicon. What do you think of that theory, guys? I'm going to check the melting point of silicon. And if it's under 900 degrees Fahrenheit, that puts it below the incandescent point, And that would ring true to our observation here. Okay, Basil, I have never seen any silicon readings in the XRF readings that you've shown me, but sometimes XRF displays can be scrolled. And if you did not scroll down to show me some of what you may consider impertinent information, maybe silicon was on there somewhere. But I don't know. Maybe it's not silicon. It's hard to say. It's uh, some strange compound is being formed, and I just thought maybe it's from the computer chips. Who knows? I need a 0.3 volts for a minute here, just to kind of see what happens. Got a little bit of gas production there. That's probably from when I first turned it on, it was at very high amps. Looks like I can add a little bit more solution. Two volts, 0.3 amps. We're still getting a little bit of production. We're not getting all that beautiful action though. Yeah, we are. Look at that. See those streamers falling off them bubbles? That's what you want to see right there. That stream of what is typically... Uh... 
All right, so it's been over an hour. A big old chunk fell off on us there. This thing has got huge. I'm gonna go ahead and pull this out of the solution. We're still seeing that real cool action. I think what we should do now is pull this out, clean that material off and throw it in this little jar and restart the test at very low voltage to see if we get any shine. Well, I sure ruined that. I barely touched it. Barely touched it. Okay, so here's the gold anode, or here's the anode after about an hour and 15 minutes or so of that high voltage attack. Now we're gonna try and do a little bit lower of a voltage to uh, preserve the anode or preserve the cathode a little bit, see if we can get a shinier deposit this time. Here is the first sample harvested from the cathode. It uh, sinks very well, was very easily decanted from the water. So it's some uh, pretty good dense stuff there, I guess. All right, fellas, so here we are. We're 10 hours in at 0.4 volts, and I'll tell you what, that electrode looks brown this time around. You tell me, is that black or brown? It looks a lot browner than it did, guys. Yeah, that is not black, guys. That very well may be gold. Look at that. That's brown, guys. This thing was not that color earlier in the test. I guess uh, there's only one way to find out. We'll have to do a test on that. Secondary corrosion happening. Good thing I wrapped this cable all the way over to here. This is probably simply from the gases emanating from this thing, the chlorine gas. 